All right, so um, I will, uh, I'll go ahead and, and introduce our speaker and then we'll get started. So we have today Dr. Ana, uh, Alicia Ranadive and she's a general pediatrician in Palmdale, California. She received her medical degree from the University of Chicago in 2015 and completed her pediatric residency at UCLA in 2018. She served as chief resident from 2018 to 2019 and was a fellow of the National Clinical Scholars Program from 2019 to 2021. During this time, she completed a master's degree in health services at the Fielding School of Public Health. Her research focused on improving screening and referral pathways for developmental delay and adverse childhood experiences. She currently serves as the Interim Director of Pediatrics at the South Valley Health Center, part of the Los Angeles County Department of Health Services. So please join me today in welcoming Dr. Alicia Ranadive as she presents this webinar on neonatal jaundice. Thank you, Dr. Alicia, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Um, like Martha said, uh, my name is Alicia, and I'm delighted to be here today. I currently work at a DHS clinic up in Palmdale, and a number of my patients um, take part in home visiting programs, and I hear really great things about it. So it's, I've never met any of you guys, and it's wonderful to, to see um, the, the wonderful nurses my patients are interacting with. All right, so let's dive in. So today, um, the outline of our talk, we're going to start off going over the physiology, um, talking about the causes and various types of neonatal jaundice. It's going to be a little science heavy in this part. We'll briefly talk about the short and long term consequences of not treating hyperbilirubinemia. We'll spend a lot of time talking about the, uh, assessing babies and diagnosing jaundice and when to refer back to the pediatrician or to the ER. And then we'll spend the second half talking about possible cases. And during that time, we'll go over how to talk to patients, language you can use, um, and strategies you can, uh, one ways of advocating for them with their pediatrician. I got a number of great questions from you guys about the specific issue of breastfeeding jaundice and the use of formula in that situation. And I'm gonna cover that in depth when we go through one of the cases in the second half. All right. I will say that is one of the, the most difficult things I do. I see a jaundice baby pretty much every day and breastfeeding jaundice comes up all the time. Okay, but starting off with the physiology. Um, so first a few definitions. I think these terms get interchanged a little bit but they mean slightly different things. So bilirubin, as you know, is a protein that's made from the breakdown of hemoglobin. Hyperbilirubinemia is what we say when the bilirubin level is extra high in the blood. And then jaundice is the exam finding when hyperbilirubinemia is so high that now your skin and your eyes look yellow. Okay, so I'm gonna go through bilirubin production at a glance. I know this is a complex um, diagram. We're gonna go through it bit by bit and understanding this, if you have a general sense, will make every single part of the types of bilirubin and the approach to bilirubin make total sense. So we're gonna start over here on this side. So like I mentioned earlier, bilirubin comes from red blood cells. Blood cells are constantly being broken down and digested. They get broken down into heme. And then from heme breaking down, you get bilirubin. Bilirubin then travels to the, the liver. It hitches a ride on its friend albumin and goes to the liver where it gets acted on by various enzymes that conjugate it, or which, which is a fancy way of saying make it water soluble so the body can get rid of it. Conjugated bilirubin that is now water soluble can be stored in the gallbladder or gets dumped out into the intestines where it mixes up with milk or food or whatever to get pooped out of the body. Um, and then there are bacteria in the gut that will convert um, bilirubin to various different forms that can also be excreted in stool. Um, but sometimes that bacteria can also unconjugate bilirubin and unconjugated bilirubin will move back into the body um, to go back into the bloodstream. And that process is called enterohepatic circulation. We're gonna talk about this a little bit more in a second. So this is a very annoying diagram. I think there's lots of arrows. And so I like to simplify it in my mind um, into this, this easier way of looking at it. Um, and this is a great way of just thinking about regular jaundice while often all babies almost look a little yellow. So we said bilirubin starts from red blood cells. That's where you get the bilirubin, travels to the liver, gets pooped out generally, enjoy my emoticon, um, or can sometimes be recycled back into the blood. 
what happens in babies. So all babies compared to grownups have more red blood cells and their blood cells have a shorter lifespan. The reason they have more blood cells, they're living in mom's tummy. It's a low oxygen world. They need to have more hemoglobin to keep themselves oxygenated in mom. Um, so this whole process is happening ramped up in babies compared to older kids or adults. More blood cells that are recycling faster means more bilirubin. What also happens in all babies is that the enzymes in the liver that are responsible for conjugating or processing the bilirubin are not very mature. So it can take up to 12 weeks for the liver to get up to adult capacity to do this. And so not only do you have extra blood cells, extra bilirubin being made, the ba a typical baby's ability to deal with that bilirubin is less because their liver can't handle it just yet. And then um, babies will have more of this enterohepatic circulation. They have more of the, compared to adults, of bilirubin being recycled back into the blood. They don't quite have enough gut bacteria yet, and they may not be feeding as much compared to uh, how much an adult is feeding. So all these three things combined together, more blood cells, liver being immature, more enterohepatic circulation contributes to what's called physiologic jaundice. And depending on the paper you look at, this is occurring in 60 to 80% of babies. Most babies are looking a little bit yellow because of these things happening in them, no matter what. Um, so a comment on uh, the course of normal uh, bilirubin in babies. It's an interesting study that was done in Brazilian babies. So uh, maybe not be totally uh, replicable among American babies, but they took a bunch of exclusively breastfed babies and measured their bilirubin every day from day one through 12, and then put it all together. And there's a few points I want to make here. So first of all, normal, normal babies, just regular old babies, their bilirubin is much higher than in adults. An adult bilirubin is, depending on the lab you're looking at, usually around 1, 1 1.2. But for babies, this is the the line, the solid line over here, this is the median. So most babies are starting out at at least four. So it's a lot higher because of what I showed you in the prior slide compared to adults. Also in all babies, bilirubin will tend to increase and peak in the first, around day three to five. So in the first two days of life, bilirubin normally is going up. And the reason for that is because when babies are in mom's tummy, mom's liver is handling all their bilirubin production. And um, it takes a couple of days as, you know, as they're out in the real world, their cells are breaking down, it takes a couple of days for bilirubin to really climb up where you see it, peaks at day three to five, liver starts to work and then levels come down on their own. Um, and this is important for two reasons. This is the reason why babies have their first doctor visit around day three to five, so you can coincide with that peak. But also what also happens day three to five is when breast milk comes in. And so this is the reason you have that overlap of breastfeeding jaundice peaking right at the time bilirubin is peaking. It's nature is not doing us a solid in this situation. Okay. Um, uh, physiologic jaundice um, will not always be detectable. So usually you need to have a level of about five to start to see yellowness in skin or in eyes. Usually starts in the head and then moves down to the toes. Um, there's some charts out there that'll say, oh, if it's in the head, it's five. And if it's in the chest, it's eight or whatever. Um, but those aren't very reliable, um, especially in darker skinned babies. So it's kind of, it's a good rule of thumb, but it's not a definitive to know how high a bilirubin level is. And then kind of uh, physiologic jaundice at a glance. Um, so the cause of it is just normal things happening in the baby. They have, they have, normal babies have more red blood cells that move faster. They have immature livers. This just is normal physiology. Usually you will see this on day two to five because you need time for that bilirubin to kind of build up. If a baby is jaundiced on day, the first day they're born, that is not physiologic jaundice. That is something else. And we'll go into that in a second. Some babies are more prone to this than others. So preemie babies, they have even less mature enzymes and then sometimes genetic factors. So particularly East Asian race, um, they have just, they take a little bit longer to have their liver enzymes mature and they're more likely to look physiologically jaundiced compared to the rest. But usually with physiologic jaundice, bilirubin levels will stay under 12. It'll resolve with time as the liver matures. And what you do for this is close monitoring and counseling parents what to look for and when to be worried. Let's get into that now. Okay, so there's lots of ways to explain uh, jaundice to babies. This is my uh, kind of go-to spiel, and I adjust it down based on how glazed over a parent's eyes look and how, how much I think they can take in. Um, so the way I explain this to people is 
Jaundice happens when a substance called bilirubin builds up in the blood. Everybody's blood has bilirubin. Normally, bilirubin is processed and removed by the liver. It takes a while for the baby's liver to mature. And sometimes this makes the baby's skin and eyes temporarily look yellow. This is my base spiel and I modify it based on other things that are happening. Okay, let's contrast. So that was physiologic jaundice happening in almost all babies for the reasons we talked about, but things can go very, very wrong. Um, and going back to this diagram will help you remember all the ways it can go wrong. So the first thing is you can have too many red blood cells. This can happen because of a process called hemolysis, so red cells breaking too much. This usually happens because of a blood type mismatch, sometimes called ABO incompatibility, and we'll get into this in detail in a second. Um, or because of genetic issues with the shape of the red blood cell. So, um, you can also have issues with cephalohematoma where babies get that little hump on their head, collect and which is a nice blood collection. In this situation, you have blood cells that are breaking even more than they should, generating even more bilirubin that the liver can't keep up with. That's a problem. Sometimes it's called increased production, too much bilirubin being made. What can also happen is in some babies, they can have problems clearing the bilirubin from the liver. This can be because of a genetic mutation leading to a, um, like a specific diagnosis. This can be because they're premature, or this can be because they have, in rare cases, some kind of other issue like their hypothyroid, or they have a metabolic problem that causes their enzymes not to work well. So the second major cause is they might have just regular blood cell recycling, but the liver for some reason is even worse at getting rid of the bilirubin load that they have. And then finally, <laughs> the, two, the two main causes that you are likely to see is increased um, enterohepatic circulation. And this can happen from breast, breastfeeding jaundice, sometimes also called breastfeeding failure jaundice. I know that's a punitive word, but I like to use that term in talks because it makes it a clear distinction from breast milk jaundice. So breast feeding failure jaundice is when you're not getting enough milk in the intestine to generate poop to get rid of the bilirubin. Your body isn't making extra. There's, it's not like you're having extra bilirubin on board. You're having the normal amount of bilirubin. Your body just can't get rid of it. And then breast milk jaundice, which we'll also get into in a second, is where there's a substance in the breast milk that causes more bilirubin to unconjugate and be reabsorbed back into the blood. We'll get into these things in a second. I, this is a summary at a glance slide. There are lots and lots of reasons for babies to be jaundiced, but the main three that you are likely to see, that we are likely to see, um, is hemolysis, breastfeeding failure, and breast milk jaundice. We're gonna spend time diving into those. I'm gonna stop on this slide because I know sometimes this gets confusing and I, wanna, I can't see if there's questions in the chat, but I'm happy to answer questions about this one before we move on. No questions yet in the chat, but if anybody has one now before we move on, um, you can go ahead and type it in or unmute yourself and ask. Okay, I think I'll move on. All right. Okay, so first let's talk about hemolysis. So hemolysis can happen in two ways. The major the more, the more common thing to see is immune hemolysis. And this usually occurs when there is a blood type mismatch. In all pregnancies, there is a roughly 15% rate of mismatch. Not all of those mismatches will lead necessarily to blood cells breaking down and jaundice. Um, you're most likely to see it in the case of a mom with type O blood. So moms who have type O blood, this, because of that, their body normally makes antibodies against type A and type B. And when mom is pregnant, those antibodies can travel across the placenta into baby and attack their cells. Um, so if mom is O and has a baby with A or B, then there's a possibility that that baby will then have hemolysis, blood cell breaking, and then bilirubinemia needing, needing therapy. Um, again, it's only in moms with type O, but not all moms in type O will have this problem. Um, and it gets better with time. Um, as once baby is out, they're no longer getting transfusions of mom's antibodies all the time. Those go away with time, it gets better. Um, another version of this is when mom is RH negative and did not receive Rogam. Um, this happens very rarely in the United States nowadays, and it's when it does, it is extremely severe. These cases happen, the jaundice is on the first day of life, they're in the NICU for days and days, um, and this is often called hemolytic disease of the newborn. 
I've seen in my seven years practicing in LA, I'm aware of one case of this happening. Um, but this is a form of hemolysis, just so much, so much blood cell breakage. Hemolysis can also happen from genetic conditions. You guys may have heard of G6PD or hereditary spherocytosis. These are situations where the blood cell has like a genetic mutation that makes them shaped funny. And then in stressful situations, like when there is birth or being sick, blood cells will break more often than they should. And so blood cells breaking, more bilirubin, liver can't keep up. We have a couple questions in the chat, I think. Yes, there's one in the, the chat. It's about um, the breast milk jaundice. So I don't know if you'll get to that okay. one at the when you get there, but the question yeah. is if there's an actual test for breast milk jaundice because okay. the moms that are told their breast milk is causing the jaundice are usually quick to stop breastfeeding. Uh, good question. Good question. We'll get there in a second. Okay. Um, any questions about this one before I move on? No. Okay. Um, so hemolysis, the cause is basically too much bilirubin production, liver can't keep up. Um, you won't always see this in the first day of life, but usually if there is jaundice in the first day of life, it's because of this. Um, risk factors are going to be what's going on in the family, usually with G6PD or hereditary spherocytosis. Someone else in the family has had it, and mom will even tell you, my kid's jaundiced, I know it's G6PD, we went through this with my older child. Or mother-in-law will say, you know, my son had this too, baby's dad had this too, this is what it is. Um, the course, um, it may progress faster because you're just generating so much bilirubin. And then, like I mentioned with RH, um, that can be very severe. When jaundice is happening because of hemolysis, usually this will need phototherapy. And this is a situation where even after you've done phototherapy and brought the jaundice or the bilirubin down, because hemolysis is still happening, it may go back up. And so these babies do need close monitoring and in rare cases may have to be admitted again, even after they're discharged from the nursery. Okay, and what I say to explain this to parents, so I start with my usual spiel about what jaundice um, is, and then I say everybody's blood contains bilirubin. Bilirubin comes from red blood cells that are being broken down and recycled. And because of your blood types not matching or because of your genetics, your baby's blood cells are breaking faster than usual. All right. Okay, so breastfeeding jaundice, the main one. Um, so breastfeeding jaundice is primarily an issue of underfeeding. The baby is making normal amounts of bilirubin that any other baby would make, but because their, take, their intake is a little low, they're not making enough poop, and so their body has no way to remove the bilirubin. Um, this usually peaks on day three to day five because you're waiting for, when did breast milk come in? Day three to five. So a baby who's hitting their normal bilirubin peak at day three, but mom's milk isn't gonna come in till day four or five, this is exactly where you see that issue. And the management for breastfeeding jaundice is to improve feeding. So when a baby is coming in, you wanna do a breastfeeding assessment. You wanna see how many feedings are happening. Is milk being made? Is there an issue with the latch or getting milk into the body? You wanna know how severely dehydrated the baby is and using a combination of those factors, you decide if you're going to include formula supplementation as part of the plan. I'm gonna go into the details of that and what to say specifically to encourage parents or reassure parents in the second half of the talk. Um, so at a glance here, breastfeeding jaundice is an issue of not enough milk. There is no way to poop out the bilirubin so it stays in the body. You generally see this around day three to five. It, you'll often see it in an exclusively bred, breastfed infant. Um, oftentimes in a mom who had a C-section, their milk may be delayed or in a first time mom who is figuring it out. Everything is so hard. Um, breastfeeding jaundice um, sometimes requires phototherapy, um, but generally improves with more milk. Milk is the medicine for breastfeeding jaundice. Um, and in these babies, they need close monitoring of weight. They may need formula supplementation, but not always. Um, and they may need lactation assistance. And they may need, but not always, readmission for phototherapy. Okay. And this is what I say to parents. I try to frame everything around feeding and not failure. So the body gets rid of bilirubin by pooping it out. The more you feed a baby, the faster their body will get rid of the bilirubin let's talk about how to increase your baby's feeds. And that's my starting point for either breastfeeding support and or formula supplementation. And we'll get, we'll dive into this more. Okay, 
breast milk jaundice. So breast milk jaundice occurs due to a unknown substance, but most likely an enzyme called glucuronidase that's present in some women's breast milk, but not everyone's that causes bilirubin to deconjugate and then get reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. And this usually happens once breastfeeding is well-established. So around day 10 to 14. Um, and in older guidance was to stop breastfeeding, um, thinking to address the question that just came up, thinking that ongoing breast milk was going to worsen, but new guidelines, do not, you do not need to do this. Um, in this situation, you should monitor the baby closely. You want to keep a close eye on what those levels are, make sure they're not so like dangerously high, make sure baby's not sick. Um, and you want to, <laughs> excuse me, rule out other causes of late jaundice that can happen at, at the two-week mark. Um, but generally, if baby's uh, levels are low and baby is doing well with no neurologic symptoms, it is okay to keep breastfeeding during breast milk jaundice. Does that answer the question that came up? I can't remember what it was exactly. Okay. Yeah, in the chat we have yes, so thank you. Okay. okay. All right, so breast milk jaundice. There is an enzyme in breast milk that leads to more enterohepatic circulation, fancy word of more breast milk or more bilirubin being reabsorbed, um, usually happens around the two week point. You will see this only in a breastfed infant of 100% formula infant will not have this issue. Um, and this improves with time. It can take up to 12 weeks. So I have a patient, a colleague's patient right now who was on like day five, a week five of ongoing breast milk jaundice, but breast like bilirubin is low. She's doing well. She is, it's a fortunate thing to have breast milk jaundice. You have a fountain of breast milk that is leading to this issue. And it's, it's okay to keep feeding when that's happening, but you do need to make sure that other things aren't happening in the background. You need to make sure this is not hemolysis or cholestasis, which is, um, uh, Billy Rubin getting stuck in the liver because of other blockages or other reasons, which we'll get into right now. Um, so how I describe breast milk jaundice to parents is sometimes breast milk contains a substance that causes problems with getting rid of Billy Rubin. This gets better with time and it is safe to keep breastfeeding, but we will monitor your baby's Billy Rubin closely to make sure the level is not too high. Okay. Um, so just a quick question oh, yeah, yeah. for you. So follow up for that in the chat. Is this mm -hmm. actually a test that you can create? Like is oh. the enzyme in the breast milk being yeah. monitored? But thank you. That is a good question. So there's no specific test that will say hundred percent, this is breast milk jaundice, but what you're, what, what you can instead can do is rule out other causes. So, um, you could do, for example, a CBC to look at the baby's hemoglobin. And if the baby's hemoglobin is dropping, you may have hemolysis. And so you have another explanation that's not breast milk jaundice, or uh, we're going to get into another type of jaundice that can present around a month, which is biliary atresia. So when you break down the different types of bilirubin. If your direct bilirubin is really high, you have another explanation going on. So that's a roundabout way of saying breast milk jaundice is kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. There's no specific blood test you can do to look for that enzyme or to, you know, to say this test positive, this is breast milk jaundice. You're using your clinical judgment to rule out all the other things. It. So our nurses then who are not maybe doing those clinical assessments, their best course would be to refer to the, the doctor Absolutely. to do those tests. hundred percent, hundred percent. So even though breast milk jaundice is benign and you can keep breastfeeding, if you see jaundice at two weeks or beyond, you should refer to the pediatrician for assessment. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Okay. Um, and so um, most of the types of jaundice I've talked about so far have been unconjugated, so the unprocessed one, um, and the approach to conjugated bilirubin is very different. This could be like a whole two-hour talk on its, on its own, so I'm not going to go into that, but there is one case I want you to be aware of really quickly, and that's biliary atresia. And so biliary atresia happens a little bit later around one month. And so um, looking at this picture here, bilirubin is made all over the liver. And then there's this like little tree of bile ducts that collect all the bilirubin and store it in the gallbladder. And in biliary atresia, over time, all these little ducts, they're open and then scar down. And so bilirubin has no way of leaving the liver. 
Um, and this is, a, this is a big deal. This requires surgery to treat, um, and sometimes the surgery fails and eventually kids need liver transplant. It's the main reason that a child would need a liver transplant. This will usually happen around one month of age. Um, and the classic symptom, because bilirubin can't get into the intestines, bilirubin is what gives one of the reasons that poop has a, a brownish or yellow color. And so if you see white poop, that's an indication that bilirubin hasn't made it into the intestines. And this is like a freak out, like do not pass go, do not collect 200, refer to the pediatrician, call GI tomorrow. This is a big deal. And the reason I bring this up is this is another, another one of those things where a baby might look yellow after two weeks. And you need to, you need to rule this out before assuming something is breast milk jaundice. And so the pediatrician needs to see the baby. Okay. Um, so the cause of this bile duct scarring, you see it a little bit later. Um, this is usually, it's genetic or it really happens for an autoimmune reason. We don't need to go into that, um, but needs surgery to address. And if you a pediatrician sees this white stools or jaundice at four weeks, like call GI right now. But also this is very, very rare, very rare. I, um, I bring this up just so you can think about the timeline of everything all together. So on the first day of life, jaundice is most likely, that shows up there is most likely to be hemolysis or blood cell breakage issue. Jaundice at the three to five day mark could still be hemolysis, um, but is more likely to be when physiologic jaundice shows up overlapping with breastfeeding jaundice. Hemolysis can take a while to get better, especially if it's, uh, you know, there's no way of stopping it. You just have to wait for time for those mom's antibodies to kind of be cleared out. Um, so hemolysis can go on for a little while, um, but breast milk jaundice will then start to show up around the 10 days, 10 day mark and can go on for a little while. And then biliary atresia usually shows up around a month. And so again, just harping that if you see jaundice past two weeks, you've got to make sure there's no other things going on before you can assume it's breast milk jaundice. All right. So the course of untreated jaundice, why do we care about this? Why is this a problem? Um, so the problem is um, really high levels of bilirubin can travel across into the brain and cause lots of neurologic issues. So the first thing you'll see, the first set of neurologic symptoms, this collection is called acute bilirubin encephalopathy. Those are early signs from high bilirubin levels in the brain, usually in the 30s or higher. Um, it'll go through a few phases and will usually impact a baby's alertness or mental status, their tone, and their cry. But I think cry is the hardest one to assess here. What defines shrill versus high-pitched? I don't really know. Um, so the first thing you will see in the first few days when Billy Rubin is super high, high 20s or 30s, is babies will look sleepy. They won't be waking up to feed when they should, or they may not be feeding well. As that progresses over several days into a week, babies may be lethargic. Um, and then eventually late stage, when this has been going on over a week, babies may be comatose or seizing. <clears throat> Other things, um, so in terms of tone, this is a little confusing because in the beginning, early stages of encephalopathy, babies will be noodly, floppy. In intermediate stages, they may be either hypertonic, so stiff or floppy. And then in late stages, they may have opisthotonus. So this is like when babies have a lot of stiffening, I'm gonna turn over. They may have like an arched back and their head up with arms out and stiff. Um, I have personally never seen this. This is extremely rare to see nowadays because of our bilirubin monitoring. Um, and then like we were talking about with cry, cry may be very high pitched. And then as bilirubin levels are increasing and the process is moving on, you may not even hear a cry at all. At this stage though, so you'll, you may see neurologic symptoms, but this is at still at a point early on where this may not be permanent. If a baby is treated appropriately, you can reverse this process, reduce bilirubin levels, get better. Okay. Um, when bilirubin levels stay really high for a long time, you can progress to something called chronic bilirubin encephalopathy. This is also called kernicteris. And the picture over here is from an autopsy, but really high bilirubin levels cross over into the brain, um, embed in the basal ganglia and can cause staining of the tissue. It's, it's like very visual. Bilirubin has landed in the brain and it turns, turns yellow on autopsy. Um, usually the symptoms from this may not show up until after the baby is a year or older, and this can be cerebral palsy, hearing loss, vision issues, like permanent neurologic changes be very severe, but never, I will say, um, this is very scary. Um, the risk is higher in babies who are preemie, 
um, and babies with very high bilirubin levels, but this is very rare in the United States now. Um, so uh, in the early 2000s, we started universal screening of bilirubin of all babies. And so now the incidence is less than actually one in 100,000. And you can see preemies more than term babies, but we have done a very good job in this country of identifying this issue and preventing it pretty much. Um, this is an, some interesting data. So Kaiser NorCal is amazing. They just pool all their data on all their babies. And you can see what happens. And they reported they had roughly half a million um, babies born between 1995 and 2011. And during that time, half a million babies, they only had 47 whose levels were higher than 30. Um, a bunch, a quarter of those were because they were having hemolysis. But one of the um, breastfeeding jaundice is not likely to take you this high, but hemolysis is. Um, and of that sample, 47, only four ended up having, over time, they've had, they had like several years of data, only had chronic bilirubin encephalopathy. So this is the fear, but because of how we monitor bilirubin, this is a lot, it's very, not very common um, and really long-term, not very common at all in the, in the US. Okay, so how do we prevent this from happening? What have we done? Um, so the general approach, the goal is to avoid encephalopathy, avoid cornicterus, have everyone's brains grow up healthy. And to ensure that this happens, the AAP has recommended a few things. So first of all, if a baby looks yellow on the first day of life, you've got to check a bilirubin level no matter what. Um, regardless though, all babies get a bilirubin check before they're discharged. So if they're discharged on day of life two or three, they get a skin or a, a blood level check. Um, and depending on when they're discharged, we'll de determine when they should be seen by the pediatrician for their next check. So if they're discharged um, before they're one day old, sometimes that happens because of COVID and no one wants to stay in the hospital. If they're discharged really early, they definitely need to be seen by day of life three, because that's going to be the earliest part of their peak. If they're discharged sometime between one and two days, they got to be seen by four days. If they're discharged between two and three days, they got to be seen by five days. And the reason for that is you just want to make sure they're seen sometime in their peak before bad things happen. Okay, and so how do we assess a baby for jaundice? <laughs> involves two parts. I'm just going to take a sip of water, sorry. Um, history and exam. Um, so first, um, you want to just talk about a family history. Was there a brother or sister who had jaundice? Um, was there a blood type issue? Did they already get um, phototherapy in the hospital because Mel may already know she has a blood type issue. Um, and probably the most important thing I asked about in history is what's going on. How are you feeding the baby and how is it going? I cannot tell you how many, I have seen every version of this where one mom was told, I don't need to feed the baby on the first day because they don't need milk. No. Or I heard a mom once tell me that, you know, the baby's very sleepy. He's only getting up every five hours. So I've only been feeding the baby every five hours. Um, diving into this history is important. So number of feedings um, and number of diapers. And when you're looking at the baby, you want to look for jaundice. So look at their skin and look at their eyes. And then you want to do a brief sense of, uh, of neurostatus. So are they floppy? fluffy or stiff, and are they sleepy or are they alert? Okay, um, so for the clinical assessment, I apologize, it's not a great picture. It was, I have no personal photos of my patients. <laughs> so it was a little bit hard to find a good jaundiced baby. Um, but the kind of rough and dirty way is to press on the skin and then look at the undertone. Um, and so a jaundice, all babies look pink to me, but underneath it, when you're blanching the skin, if it, you have a yellow undertone, that's an indication of jaundice. Move the baby to the window or to a good light in dim lighting. It can sometimes be hard to see this well. Um, but remember always, it's difficult to know, you know, I think eye jaundice is pretty clear. Scleroelectris is clear, but sometimes it can be hard to tell. Does the jaundice stop at the belly or does it stop at the groin? It's kind of hard to tell. And so my rule of thumb is if you see jaundice in the eyes or the face, just send them in. Um, so, or sorry, below the chest. So yellow eyes, jaundice below the chest, send them to their pediatrician. If you are also finding a baby who is low tone, so floppy, um, sleepy and hard to wake or not feeding, I would send them to the ER. And in general, I think that's a good rule of thumb. There's lots of reasons that can make a baby floppy or sleepy. Um, and if that's happening, there, there may be something up. There could be a metabolic reason, lots of reasons, but it overlaps with the situation of, of high levels of bilirubin and you should send them to the ER. If you are confused, you can always call the pediatrician and use that as a, as a triage point for assistance. 
Okay, measuring bilirubin. So what will um, most clinics, but not all clinics can do a transcutaneous measurement. So that's where you use a skin monitor, um, either on the baby's chest or on their forehead um, to get a quick and quick estimate of their serum bilirubin level. Um, it is non-invasive. It's usually based on studies that compare skin level to a blood level, usually within two to three points accuracy. It will be less reliable, so not as accurate in a darker skin baby, in a baby who's already had phototherapy before, and then above 12, it's hard to know if that's real or not. So above, different clinics will have different cutoffs, but in my clinic, if you get a skin level above 12, it's an automatic go get a blood test to confirm. Um, transcutaneous bilirubin is nice though, because you don't need a needle and a serum bilirubin, of course you will, but it will be more accurate. And if you're making a decision about whether to admit or to do phototherapy, generally you want the serum. Okay. So this, this part gets a little bit confusing, um, but how do you assess a bilirubin and how do you decide the risk level? Um, you may have heard terms like high risk high intermediate risk, low risk, and what, what the heck does that mean? So in the 90s, a very prominent neonatologist, Dr. Bhutani, put together what is called the Bhutani nomogram. And that is like a, a compilation of bilirubin trajectories that help us risk stratify. And what these risk levels are telling you is, what is the risk of progression that this baby will keep rising so high they need phototherapy? That is the question that the risk is telling you. And so, and then the difference between these high intermediate and low intermediate are the percentiles of where, uh, of like com combining, comparing them to all babies. So the cutoff here between high and low intermediate is the 75th percentile of all babies. And so babies in this, uh, just hold on, this is covered. Okay, so your risk of progression matters based on which of these categories you fall into. So a baby who is, you know, two days old, baby who's two days old and has a billy of, you know, seven would fall right over here. Their risk of progression so high that they would need phototherapy is about 3%. A baby whose bilirubin lands, you know, they're two days old and their billy is like 12 their bilirubin is high intermediate risk. They have about 12% risk of progressing to needing phototherapy. And then, you know, 40% if they're in this high risk zone. I'm gonna stop there for a second. Was that confusing, clear? Got a couple thumbs up, um, okay. but nothing in the chat for now. Okay, perfect, okay. Um, so here is just a driving it home with an example. This was a child I had recently. So she was three days old with the total bilirubin of 14. So three days old, 14. This girl was high intermediate risk for progression to needing phototherapy. I saw her for the first time on day three and I brought her in the next day so I could monitor to see what was going on. Okay. So when do you start phototherapy though? And the there is no set cutoff for when you start phototherapy. It depends on the gestational age, the hours of life, and the individual risk factors of the baby. And so there's a whole separate chart to determine when you're gonna get phototherapy. And now this has, this is where I think um, interpreting Billy's a little confusing because their risk, the term risk is being used in a different way now. Um, so in the prior chart I just showed you, it was risk of progression. And now it's how risky is this individual child for their own bilirubin getting so high that they have brain problems. And there's, you're gonna, what to interpret this, you'll figure out which category your baby falls into and then use that line as your cutoff for phototherapy. And to do that, you will combine their gestational age with this set of risk factors. So we are most lenient with babies who are term and have none of these things true. So if they're term, they don't have G6PD, they're not septic, they're not having wild temperature issues, they are lower risk for having um, brain issues from the bilirubin level, you can be lenient with them. And so for those babies, the bar to where you would start phototherapy is the highest. For a baby, who is term, but does have some of these risk factors, or for a baby who's preterm and has none of these things, you can be medium lenient. And you would use the red line as your cutoff for deciding when to use phototherapy. 
And then the highest risk or the, the situation where we're the most careful is a preterm baby who does have one of these risk factors. You are very careful with those and you start phototherapy at the lowest level. And the reason I bring this up, I had a staff member in my own clinic ask me recently, she said, doctor, I heard that at age, if the bilirubin is 15, you have to admit for phototherapy no matter what. And this hopefully will help you see the answer to that question. So uh, at two days old, at a level of 15, pretty much any baby, no matter what their gestational age, no, where did my mouse go? Sorry. Uh, no matter their gestational age and no matter their risk factors, pretty much any baby, you would hit their cutoff for needing phototherapy. So true. But bilirubin normally rises. And so the level at where we worry about needing phototherapy changes hour to hour, day to day. So if a baby comes in on day of life four at 96 hours and their bilirubin is 15, wait a sec, a term baby who has no risk factors we are way below the blue line. And so no, we don't automatically need to admit that baby if the level was 15 on day of life four. So this is a convoluted way of saying the way you decide if a baby needs admission for phototherapy depends on their gestational age and their individual risk factors. The cut and the cutoff number is going to change hour to hour, day to day. Questions, concerns about this part? Okay, all right. Oh, so this is my sample baby from the prior slide. So uh, my sample baby, day of life three, her bilirubin was 14. She was term with no risk factors. I needed to follow her up closely because she was high intermediate risk for still moving on. But because she's term with no risk factors, her cutoff would be the blue line. She's well below it. I can sleep well tonight and see her tomorrow and see how things go. All right. And then you may have seen this before the way um, in the olden days, we would have like little printouts of this chart and then go over and figure out what the bilirubin level was. And now there's all kinds of electronic tools. So billytool.org is a great website where you can plug in the hours of life and the bilirubin number, and it plots out for you what exactly you're going to do. So this was another child I saw recently who was discharged early. Um, and so she, you know, her, she was high intermediate risk, meaning I needed to follow her up soon, but she was then close to her Billy light level, but not above. Okay. Um, so how you, you treat bilirubin is with phototherapy. This is, just blows my mind that this works. So blue light at the wavelength of about 460 nanometers is like the exact right wavelength to not um, conjugate bilirubin, but it converts bilirubin into a more water soluble form that you can pee out instead of poop out. Um, this is the reason that we do phototherapy instead of just putting the baby in the window is the baby in the window is getting the full spectrum of light. So all the different wavelengths and then phototherapy is I'm just going to concentrate the blue light onto you just work extra, extra, extra on the bilirubin. Um, this is what it looks like in the hospital. Um, and sometimes babies will get a blanket and they'll get one cover and they'll, we'll do lights on different sides on different sides of the incubator to really increase the amount of light they're getting. They'll be monitored pretty closely. So sometimes every four hours, every six hours to watch the bilirubin drop. Um, and then babies will, there's different protocols in different hospitals, but generally babies will be kept until their bilirubin drops under 14. Um, and then they can be, can be discharged home. Phototherapy works amazing, but sometimes it's not enough. And so if your bilirubin is rising so fast um, that uh, it may be rising so fast that phototherapy is not enough to clear it. Um, we do something called exchange transfusion. This is an intense procedure. So what this means is that you're essentially replacing the baby's blood volume. You are, what they'll do is connect two syringes to the baby. They'll pull out 10 cc's of bilirubin containing blood from the baby and inject 10 cc's of fresh blood. It has to be done manually. So pull insert, pull, insert by the neotail just standing at the side of the bed. It is wild. Um, the threshold, there's a whole other chart for when you're gonna decide to do this. Generally, this is numbers that are 20 or higher um, and you do not want this to happen to your child. This is very intense um, and it's not benign. Um, people can, babies can have blood clots, infections, electrolyte issues. It's like you're having a full transfusion of your blood volume um, and you want to avoid this at all costs. So more reasons why we are very 
uh, careful with monitoring and deciding uh, when to start phototherapy for a baby. Okay, so we're gonna dive into some practice cases. Uh, I was checking my time over here. Um, all right, so case one, these are all based on real patients I've seen with slight modifications to make it more teachable. So this is a recent patient, um, baby was, um, I'm, I'm pretending it's from your perspective and for, forgive me, I'm not exactly sure your timeline of visits for when you guys see patients. Um, so I've tried to make it your perspective and then showing you uh, the physician perspective when they come in the clinic. Um, so first we've got a three day old 39 weeker discharged yesterday. This is mom's second baby. She formula fed her first baby, but she's very committed to breastfeeding the second child. And she proudly tells you that she thinks her milk has come in, but she is worried that the baby looks a little yellow and wants you to take a look. And what would you like to know? And as a hint, here are the uh, history and exam features we discussed earlier in the slide. So what would you wanna know from this mom? Like yellowing overall, like mm -hmm. and below the nipple line in the whites of the eyes, um, how feeding's going as well. Absolutely. I would want to know how many diapers has baby had. Absolutely. The output, absolutely. I've got two in the chat for you. I don't know if you can see it. Um, how often is mom breastfeeding? It, mm -hmm. Is there audible swallowing? And yep. then did her previous child have jaundice and her blood type? Yes. Excellent. That's the sum total of things I would want to know. Perfect. Um, so, uh, so here in terms of the intake, um, mom is putting the breast baby to breast all the time, whenever she sees hunger cues and she thinks that's all the time. So frequency is very high in terms of output. The baby is three days old and has already had three wet diapers. There was one poopy diaper on it looked greenish. So it sounds like it's transitioning. Um, and when you look at the baby, only the face and eyes are yellow and he's alert. He's fussing when you open his swaddle and he calms down pretty easily. I did not comment on the uh, risk factors, but let's assume that there was no blood type issues um, and no family history. And what would you tell this mom to do? I would say that this is um, jaundice that's just on the face and eyes. This baby sounds like they're breastfeeding well, their intake is good, their output is appropriate, they don't have any risk factors. This is probably physiologic jaundice, but the eyes are yellow. Um, so I would have this baby follow up as scheduled. They were discharged yesterday. They should be seen within a day or two of discharge. So the pediatrician can assess, monitor, and see if they need anything extra. This is a very common situation, but a good case where mom is breastfeeding well and she, she's got it, it's coming together. Um, and so the, this is the point I wanna, this is a very straightforward case. All babies need to be followed up. Um, actually, I should change this. It's not that they need bilirubin measure, they need a physician assessment within a few days of discharge. And then just to remember, physiologic jaundice occurs in a lot of babies. And even breast, uh, just because the baby's breastfed, they will not necessarily have a problem. They can still have physiologic jaundice too. And I, sorry, I should have corrected this. They don't need follow bilirubin billy, billy measured. They need a physician assessment. Okay. Um, and so this mom asks you, will, my, will jaundice hurt my baby? A very, very common question. And what I would respond to that is in most cases, jaundice gets better and it's not dangerous, but rarely it can get very high and can cause problems in the brain. And that's why monitoring is important. Um, I tailor this statement to how, uh, uh, to the individual parent. I do not necessarily mention brain impact to everybody. Okay. All right. So this is my, I'm going to move on to this one. So this is a three day old 39 weeker. This is mom's first baby. She was discharged after a difficult del delivery and looks very overwhelmed. She is trying to breastfeed, but her nipples are cracked and bleeding and the baby is not latching. You gently peek at the baby who looks a little yellow. And what do you want to know?
I think you guys, you guys get the gist here. It's the same stuff basically that you would want to know in the prior case. Um, so mom is not sure if her breast milk has come in. She's been putting the baby to breast only when he gets up um, and he's been sleeping for every four hours. So she's or sleeping up to four hours. So she's really not feeding him that much in terms of his output. He's only had one wet diaper and he's had zero poopy diapers. And when you look at him, he looks yellow down to his belly button, um, but you can wake him up. He's not floppy. You can get him to have a really good cry. So this is a baby where we're not sure how much milk is going in, not a lot of output to prove that milk is going in and looks decently yellow, but does not look like there's any significant neurologic impact just yet. So in this case, I would definitely send the baby to the pediatrician. Um, so baby goes in and baby's weight is down 9% and his bilirubin is 16 at 77 hours of life. And the pediatrician recommends formula and rechecking the baby the next day. And so why, why did they do this? All right. So first of all, let's talk about how bad is that bilirubin? The bilirubin was 16 at 77 hours of life. We plug that into our charts and our tools. And so that puts us in a high intermediate risk of progression to needing phototherapy. And then when we check weight, when exactly do they need therapy? Okay, thank goodness they're still below the blue line. I didn't tell you this was a term baby with nervous factors. This is a term baby with nervous factors. They are below the blue line where they would need phototherapy, but they're getting pretty gosh darn close to it. So this is a baby we have to monitor really closely because they're getting close to the point where they're gonna need phototherapy. So the way I try to present this to parents is that breastfeeding jaundice is a problem of underfeeding. The medicine for breastfeeding jaundice is milk. Milk is the medicine. And the, you are going to, the goal is to get milk into the baby at all costs because they're not making extra bilirubin, they just can't get rid of it. Um, and so the most simple thing to do is to increase the feeding, feed more often, feed at least eight times in 24 hours, which means feeding every two or three hours at a minimum. And I never want to wake a sleeping baby, but this is a situation where I'm sorry, mama, but you've got to, you've got to feed the baby every two or three hours. And the first thing is to support breastfeeding, to do anything you can to normalize the struggle and to help figure out what the issue is and to make breastfeeding work better, to get the milk in the baby. Um, that might mean it's be as simple as increasing the feeds, though usually there's something more at play. So there's usually latch is not great, baby's not getting their mouth all the way open, baby may have a tongue tie, mom may need a little bit of help with positioning, so doing side lie or across or whatever. Um, she may have inverted nipples and need a nipple shield. She may be cracking. She might need nipple cream. She might need lactation to weigh in. Um, but the, the goal is to milk is a medicine. You've got to increase the ability for milk to get in the baby. And the huge part of that is figuring out what's going on with breastfeeding. Is there something we can do to help the mom breastfeed better? Um, and in some cases though, in some cases, if baby has a lot of weight loss, baby's looking dehydrated, or if bilirubin is near a phototherapy level, you might not be able to just wait for breastfeeding to improve. And in that case, milk is the medicine, and you've just got to give a little bit of formula to get you through the time when breast milk can, breastfeeding is going well. I'm going to come back to the slide in a second, but I want to actually move to this one. So this is how I talk through a parent with the common questions they have. And so should you stop breastfeeding? And what I say is no, formula is a supplement. It is not a replacement. You should still try to breastfeed. But in some cases, when formula is being recommended, it's extra. It's milk is the medicine and you've got to get milk in the baby somehow. I also say um, is big, people say, okay, does this mean I failed at breastfeeding and I have to use formula permanently from here on out? And the answer is no. Formula is temporary. It is a bridge until breast milk comes in. You're in that window where jaundice happens at the same time where breast milk hasn't come in yet. And you want to, you're, the ideal way is to use formula as a temporary, temporizing measure until breast milk comes in. And part, what I often hear from moms is, is this my fault? Did I do something wrong? Did I make my baby sick? And the answer is no, it is normal, normalize, normalize. It is normal for some, in some moms, breast milk doesn't come in until five days and we need to find a way. Milk is the medicine. We have to find a way of getting you through the next few days until breast, breast milk comes in and breastfeeding is going really well. 
Um, and then what else can you do? Um, there's lots of things to do. Um, so is to assess the latch. Um, a lot of times birth hospitals may have a lactation consultant that you can still speak with. Um, people may need to go to WIC. There might be community organizations that can help you out. There's lots of things we can do to work on milk transfer so breastfeeding goes better. I'm gonna stop here for a second. Questions? I've got one in the chat um, regarding this piece. Is it true that breast milk has a natural laxative that can help the baby poop? Ah, oh, that is a wonderful question. Wonderful question. Breast milk compared to formula has a different protein breakdown. Um, so this gets very technical, um, but um, breast milk has more whey protein and formula has more casein protein and the whey protein is easier to digest and digest faster. Um, the difference between these is when whey protein hits stomach acid, it stays liquid. When casein protein hits stomach acid, it becomes solid. And so formula, that's why formula babies poop um, less and they have more solid poops um, because of that casein protein. So it's not that breast milk is easier, uh, has something that makes it easier to digest. It's just the combination of proteins is a little easier on the belly. I have a question. Mm -hmm. I tried typing it, but my laptop's not letting me type. <laughs> um, my question is sometimes I've had clients where they'll tell me the doctor recommended no formula. I mean, sorry, no breastfeeding formula only. Mm. What, why is that? And I've tried doing my own research on it and I can't really find many things to like support that. Is that just like an old school thing or? That's a very tricky question. Um, that is generally an old school thing. There is no formal mm -hmm. A guideline that says you should stop breastfeeding. And in fact, when you do, you will now cause lowered supply for mom and maybe knock out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what, like, I've thought when I've had, and this has come up actually many times. Um, what do you, like, what do you recommend we, um, you know, right. suggest. Yeah. yeah, because I mean, we can't necessarily go against doctor's orders, but at the same time, it's like, well, that's not. <laughs> yeah, that's not, I've, usually what I've done is like I've said, well, I can send you the guidelines and you can make your own decisions. But then mm -hmm. again, I feel like that's also like going against oh, doctor's weird. orders. It's a liability thing, kind of weird. Yeah. I will say some, some caveats. So um, if a baby is severely dehydrated, um, like I've had some cases where baby is 10% or more, um, where I worry that the act of breastfeeding takes energy, it's harder to do. So a baby who's on there and they may be expending energy when they're trying to latch. And I know milk isn't really in, in that situation, I may be like, I got to prevent a hospitalization for dehydration here. And in that situation, I may say just just like pump your milk, but feed the baby. Like you've got to milk is medicine. You have to get milk in that baby. And in that situation, I may say formula feed first before breastfeeding, before trying breastfeeding. Um, in this situation where your patient has gotten that advice, um, I would encourage them to ask the to have a discussion with the doctor as to why they're making that recommendation um, and to ask the doctor what is their plan for introducing breast milk back. Um, you're right that it's very tricky to, uh, I don't think you should be in a position of counseling someone to go against what their physician says. Mm -hmm. um, but I think maybe understanding in those situations, is this a severe dehydration situation? Are they trying to prevent a hospitalization? Are they right next to the phototherapy level? And they don't wanna be there. Ex I would so explore the reason for why that has been said and then to ask about, okay, but how do I, when do I start breastfeeding again? When can I do this? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I don't know if that's a perfect answer to your question, but your the simple response to that is there is no guideline that says in plain simple breastfeeding jaundice stop breastfeeding. Yeah, yeah, I get it all the time, and it kind of like it makes me like you know it upsets me because I'm like you're you're just gonna limit your supply. You're you know it's yeah. not necessary. So yeah, but I've gotten that a lot. What um, you could also say though is um, to continue pumping. Um, so yeah, I usually I'll do. Yeah. Okay. Continue pumping. And then I've had I've had moms that'll say, yeah, the doctor told me to stop breastfeeding, but I still breastfeed my baby. So 
I usually don't comment on it. I'll just say like, okay, good. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, it's just, it's, yeah, it's weird, but that's good to know. It is frustrating. And what I'll sometimes do, you may have encountered this too, is the concept of triple feeding. So for a baby who is not severely dehydrated, needs a little oomph, is we'll tell patients to put baby on breast for a certain amount of time. So 15, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes max. After that, baby's just expending energy. After 30 minutes, hand the baby to another, to dad or to grandma or whoever, let mom pump. Um, so the, the point of pumping right after is maybe baby's latch isn't great. Let mom ex get any pumped milk she has out and you have that on hand for her next feed. Okay. Offer the baby pumped milk if you have it from before. But if you don't have pumped milk and baby is still, you know, rooting around or showing their hunger cues, offer a little formula top off. And that's mm -hmm. the ideal way to supplement. So breastfeed first, handoff, pump and then offer a top off if showing hunger cues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. There's also a comment in the chat, I think it helps with this too, that um, Ileana mentioned that sometimes it sounds that sounds like what clients hear from the doctors, your milk is causing the jaundice mm -hmm. versus it's a low supply. So maybe mm -hmm. that's a counseling or a discussion too, that, mm -hmm. you know, what, what was said and how, how they heard it and what was, um, yeah, I think that's a great point and one I didn't even think of at all. I often, you know, there's so much to be said in these doctor visits. They're often like 20, 30 minutes for a newborn. You have so many things to cover and you're doing it with a woman who either just had a surgery or just had stitches put in their GU area and haven't slept at all. And it's, it's very, it's hard for people to take in large amounts of information in that moment when they feel not great. Um, and a lot of you guys know. Um, I think that's a great point to think about. It's clarifying uh, maybe what was said and helping the mom work with the, the medical team to understand their reasons and then maybe some of the nuance in what was conveyed. I have a question. Um, I've had clients tell me that the doctors recommend the vitamin D drops because it helps with jaundice. Is that true? Is it, does it help significantly or don't we do any? That is an excellent question. Um, and I think this speaks to the phenomenon brought up in the prior question. Vitamin D does not help with the jaundice, but it's recommended for breastfeeding babies. Um, because as you know, breast milk doesn't have full amount of vitamin D that babies need. And so I think this gets conflated in patients' minds where they think I'm breastfeeding, so I need this, but baby's also jaundice. That's why I'm doing this. But no, vitamin D does not help with improving the clearance of bilirubin. Sorry <laughs> to pay you back on that question. Mm -hmm. So what exactly is the supplementation for? Is it just because breast milk isn't a good source of vitamin D? So yes. I know like all babies should be on a vitamin D supplement technically. Um, but why is it more recommended for jaundice babies? It's not that it's more recommended for jaundice babies. It's more recommended for breastfed babies. So the reason is breast milk does not concentrate vitamin D in mom's blood does not land in breast milk. Well, yeah. so breast milk doesn't have the full amount, the full daily amount required for a baby. Um, and formula does, but for, in order to get full vitamin D from formula, you need around 30 ounces. And most new babies are not eating 30 ounces on their first few days, but they get there eventually. So that's the, so all babies will, and I will say not all pediatricians are good about this as a newer recommendation. So babies who are getting less than 30 ounces of formula, whether that's because they're exclusively breastfed or they're exclusively formula fed, but haven't yet reached 30 ounces need the mm -hmm. supplement. But once you hit, you know, like a four month old, who's taking 32 ounces a day does not need a supplement anymore. And then it, that can stop. So the supplement is until you're getting enough vitamin D from your milk, whatever source it is. And it has nothing to do with clearing the jaundice or clearing the bilirubin from the blood. So the, the natural sunlight recommendation isn't because of the vitamin D it's because of the rays. It, yes. Um, it's because of, um, because of in natural sunlight, you're still getting some of 
natural sunlight is all the colors of light. And so you're still getting some blue light in there that can clear some jaundice. I see. So it has nothing to do with the vitamin D in the sunlight. Correct. Wow. OK, interesting. Cool. Thank you. Can the breastfeeding mother take a vitamin D supplement? Good question. There is some new newer data data on this where mom would need to take pretty high levels of vitamin D for it to concentrate in breast milk enough. Um, right now, this is not a universal guideline or recommendation, though it may change in coming years when we have more information on this. But for now, it's baby takes a supplement. We had a couple questions about the indirect um, and direct sunlight piece. So um, I know you, you mentioned it briefly, but I'll read them to you and see if that, that mm -hmm. helps. So there's one um, was talking about indirect sunlight versus direct time mm -hmm. of day if the baby goes outside mm -hmm. and then what to do if it isn't sunny. And the mm -hmm. other question okay. is similar, like does sunlight have any effect on the actual bilirubin levels? This is, these are excellent questions. Um, so first, um, the direct versus direct sunlight. The indirect is better. Um, one of the downsides of direct, babies are tiny, they can't regulate their temperature as well as a grown up or a big kid can. And so with direct sunlight, they can overheat um, or be sunburned. Um, so indirect is the best. And that means by the window, like not outside on the patio with the direct, I work in Palmdale, like do not put your baby in Palmdale sun, that is a bad idea. Um, the next question, I'm sorry, there were three questions there. The other one was, um, yeah, time of day if you oh. are to go outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I actually, I don't know the answer to that. I'm happy to look into that. And then could I maybe email you, Martha, and get back to the group with the answer? Definitely. Yeah. And then the other is like, if it isn't sunny and it's cloudy instead, is there a, a different way to, to get that? Um, I would say... For this, um, putting baby in indirect sunlight are all like soft ways of helping improve bilirubin. If a baby is near their phototherapy level, sunlight is not gonna cut it and they have to be admitted for phototherapy. Um, but so these are just helpful ways of dealing, indirect sunlight is a helpful way of dealing with the physiologic jaundice that as we know, gets better with time. If it's a cloudy day, do not despair. Keep feeding the baby because milk is medicine um, and wait for the baby's normal processes to clear bilirubin on its own. And, but if you think that bilirubin is worse or jaundice is worsening, so eyes look yellow or skin is looking more yellow, bring the baby in. Sometimes I'll, I'll end visit a mother will tell me that the pediatrician recommended um, 15 minutes of sunlight. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they're not clear on indirect versus whether it was direct, but that 15 minutes, is that something that is like a standard thing or? No, I think that's a, there's no rule that no one has studied that there'd be, it would be pretty hard to randomize people to 15 versus zero versus one hour of sunlight. Um, but I think that's a good, I think that's a, uh, like a helpful way of here's another option. Here's part of your arsenal of ways that you can improve physiologic jaundice. And it would be, it would always be indirect. So no direct sunlight for baby. These are great questions. It's very helpful to hear this other perspective. I have a question on the side effects of the phototherapy because mm -hmm. I've asked that it has been linked to uh, leukemia, kidney cancer in children. Um, do you know anything yeah. about that? I can't speak to the numbers about that. Um, I don't know if that's been found to be a true cause or if that's just a correlation that might have been seen. The more common side effects is that, uh, say a baby actually had um, a biliary atresia or some other cause of Un, uh, or conjugated bilirubin getting into the weeds a little there, um, then phototherapy won't work on them. And so it'll just make the bilirubin look darker in their skin. And that's called bronze baby syndrome. And then sometimes babies can get a little bit too warm and may accidentally dehydrate in there. Um, but in general, um, lots of big studies have been done, like uh, countries like Denmark keep records on all the babies in the whole nation. And so when you look at countrywide studies like that, they generally have not found those correlations like cancer to be true in the future. Um, but I can't, in the in US data, to answer your question specifically, I don't have an exact number on leukemia or kidney cancer, but I'm happy to get back to Martha with that info. 
All right, I have one more question. Um, I'm just curious, um, the, the Billy Blanket is mm -hmm. where a parent, if they had that option, if they can take that home, like when would that be um, recommended by a pediatrician or like okay to do versus a hospital, you know, situation for phototherapy? Great question. This is a newer thing. Not all insurance will cover it, but it's great because it can shorten the hospital stay. Um, so it will be used um, if babies have do not, they can't be hemolyzing, they can't be uh, late preterm, um, and they can't have any of those neurotoxicity risk factors. So no G6PD, no sepsis, no temperature issues. They have to be like the, the wellest baby to have this happen. Um, and they don't have to be at phototherapy level, but it's generally used when you're like two or three points below, um, but you still might be high intermediate risk for progression. So it's trying to avoid um, a baby being readmitted for phototherapy in the future. Different hospital set, uh, settings have different um, approaches to these. I work in DHS. Uh, my population is 100% Medi-Cal, and we have not been able to get Billy Blankets approved. Um, but other, I know um, like Kaiser is really good about doing this and then sending home home nursing to, to work with mom. So that was long answer. Short answer is for babies who have no other risk factors, otherwise well, a little bit below their light level to prevent them from needing a longer stay or being readmitted. Thank you. All right. Any other questions on this topic? Okay, um, hold on, where's my mouse? Okay, um, so a few things to avoid um, with this. We've touched on this a little bit. Um, sometimes people will say to alternate breast milk and formula. I try to move away from this because that reduces the total num number of times you're breastfeeding. So then that's then gonna decrease supply. Um, but a caveat, if you're also say you're pumping eight times a day or you're pumping to make up for the formula feeds that could work. Um, and then this is to address the comment one of you guys had, I would avoid stopping breastfeeding um, or pumping for an entire day. Cause same thing, you want to do everything in your power to increase breast milk supply. And then these are the situations where if a doctor is, is recommending this, I would really, I would encourage a patient to pry into the reason why, why do you say this and not something else? Um, and then other things is in addition to supplementation, breastfeeding, you may just need help. It is hard to breastfeed. So encourage people to ask when formula can be stopped. In some cases, if baby's not super dehydrated, um, there's an option to syringe feed. And the benefit of this is that baby is not being exposed to uh, another bottle or a nipple, which will then make it hard to, it's just easier. It's easier to bottle feed. So once a baby realizes, oh my God, why do I have to try so hard? I can get my milk fast like this. It may be hard in some kids to go back. So this is not something I had a kid recently who was down 10%. Like I can't mess around with syringes at that point. Um, but it might be an option for a kid who's not super dehydrated. Um, and then always, always encourage breastfeeding support. And so we've, we've touched on all these things. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to harp on this too much. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to a third case. This is a quick one. So this is a three week old 39 weeker mom's second baby. She's very experienced at breastfeeding. She last went to the pediatrician when the baby was five days old. The baby's blood bilirubin was checked and mom said everything looks fine. But you look at the baby, the baby looks a little yellow. This is going to move on in, in interest of time. Um, so mom's milk is in um, and she's when she's pumping, she's getting a really good amount of milk out. Baby has a good latch, is cluster feeding and feeding on demand. She's getting a wet diaper and a dirty diaper with every feed. She's reading to you from the textbook of what good breastfeeding looks like. But it looks yellow. Baby's yellow down to her belly button. Eyes are yellow, but she's awake and alert, doing everything she should be doing in five weeks. So in this case, I would definitely send the baby in because they're three weeks old. Jaundice has persisted and they're yellow in their eyes too. The pediatrician checks the bilirubin level. And in this case now they check not just the total, but they look for the direct slash the conjugated bilirubin. I didn't go into this in that much detail. Um, her bilirubin is 12 and she does not seem to have high direct bilirubin. So it's probably not biliary atresia. And then this is an example now of breast milk jaundice. 
So in this case, you saw jaundice. If you see jaundice beyond two weeks, definitely send them in. Pediatrician ruled out some crazy things, probably breast milk jaundice, okay to keep breastfeeding, but monitor. And then the um, frequency of monitoring will depend on what's going on with the baby. So sometimes we'll do weekly, sometimes we'll do every two weeks to just to make sure things get better. All right, pretty straightforward. Um, and so yeah, just refer if jaundice persists. And then the last one, this is a real case from I saw in my residency. This was a nine day old 36 weeker, so late preterm baby. He was jaundiced on the first day of life. He got phototherapy for two days. And then on day of life three, his billy was 12, not that bad, exclusively breastfed, but mom was sick. So mom had to be, mom had severe uterine bleeding and she had to be readmitted. And so they missed baby's follow-up visit um, and couldn't come in to see the baby just yet. So now it's nine days of life. When you go see this baby, milk is in and baby is feeding pretty well. Um, and until today, the latch was pretty good. And he's had three wet diapers, so milk is going in, but his eyes are yellow and his skin is bright yellow all the way down to his toes. And he's sleepy, but he can still react a little bit. And he, you know, you unwrap him, he cries. He's, he's still a little bit with it. So this baby, oopsie. This baby went to the doctor's office where he had gained good weight. So breast milk was going in, but this baby, when he went into the doctor's office, his baby, Billy Rubin was 38, which is radically wild. So this baby ended up getting admitted to the NICU. Um, 38, you don't even need a chart to tell you that is not right. Um, so this baby got phototherapy while they were waiting to exchange, to set up the exchange transfusion. He got um, he was treated for four days because his billy was in the thirties. They wanted to see if his brain was impacted, but he was not having seizures on his EEG. His brain MRI looked nice and normal. Um, and it took him quite a while for his billy to Rubin to get better. So he actually went to a, a, some, a community hospital, I think Northridge, I can't remember, um, where they started phototherapy. They didn't have the ability to do exchange transfusion. Phototherapy got his bilirubin down from 38 to 27. So he was only at 27 when he came to UCLA. Um, and then it took days, almost a week for the bilirubin to be where we felt it was consistently safe and fine. And this kid ended up having a G6PD variant and I got him so sick. But the, as far as I know, it's been three years, the child is doing well. So even though this bilirubin was really high and in the 30s, um, the, it was caught relatively quick. So the kid had been having those symptoms only for a couple of days of being very yellow. Um, didn't, his brain didn't hang out in a bilirubin of above 30 for a long period of time and ended up getting appropriate care and doing well. But this case is a illustrative to me. This is my worst nightmare as a pediatrician where someone doesn't realize um, or doesn't realize when to know they should have, they missed the appointment. Here's what I should have been looking for. Um, and Billy Rubin is slowly creeping up at home. I have a question for you about that case. If, uh, mm -hmm. if one of our um, welcome baby nurses had seen the family prior to this and it wasn't so high and they had co kind of coached them to go in and have it monitored, would this potentially have been prevented if, in that case? I think so for sure. I think so for sure. I don't think this was a day. I think this was just building up because we knew the kid had already gotten phototherapy. So this is a kid who may have had a rebound and so she probably was going up at a low level and we caught them here. But if we had caught them here, we could have maybe done just phototherapy avoided exchange. Got it. Okay. Thank so, you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just the, this is same stuff I've been saying the whole time that, you know, a ma majority of babies will experience a little bit of physiologic jaundice just because of how their body is working. The most common types of pathologic jaundice are because of hemolysis, inadequate breastfeeding, or the breast milk itself. And then untreated jaundice um, can rarely lead to dangerous and possibly permanent neurologic change. And the main things are when you encourage someone to see the pediatrician, if their eyes are yellow or yellows, they're yellow below the chest um, and definitely look out for jaundice in, if they're jaundiced and sleepy, low tone, not feeding well, be more concerned. All right. I think I'm ending a little bit early. Um, I'm happy to take more questions. There's one more in the chat that just came in. Um, do babies get checked for G6PD when they're born? 
Great question. Um, I think there are some states that may have it in their newborn screen, um, but it's not routinely done, no. Some people think that maybe that should be routinely done, um, but the incidence is fairly low, so no. I've seen G6PD maybe uh, seven or eight times. And in every situation, it was the someone in the family knew. They're like, this happened to an uncle, this happened to the sibling. We, or it was all throughout the, the mother's chart. Like we knew we were waiting, waiting for it to happen in the baby. Also, while we're waiting to see if any more questions come through, I did, um, I think all of the, the nurses know about the Breastfeed LA resource directory, and many of you are IBCLC, so you would be a good point of contact for some of those breastfeeding concerns, but I did want to put that in the chat too, in case you don't know that there's a, a Breastfeed LA has a resource directory that you can type in, um, it's actually, there's a map, and then there's also like a typing zip code area that you can type in and then it gives you a bunch of different um, lactation resources in the whole community. So I'll put that in the chat if you guys have other um, resources you want to share too, since that's such an important piece of this. Um, we'll include those with our resources that we send out afterwards. But um, yeah, I'll add that in there. And then a number of our, our nurses are also IBCLC, so they would be that cool. point of contact for the Welcome Baby team, but some That's teams don't great. have one. So I didn't realize that many of you guys are IBCLCs. That's wonderful. What I'm curious, um, when you guys are doing breastfeeding counseling, what are the common um, or the most common misconceptions that you see and the... Uh, I'm curious um, what other comments you hear from physicians that maybe derail the breastfeeding process. A question. So um, I feel like one of the common situations that I come across is that, you know, sometimes the baby's not latching onto the breast for whatever reason, um, whether it's the mom's nipples, but a lot of these moms are pumping and their milk supply is really great. And I feel like a lot of times that's not really being assessed. Mm -hmm. Like the doctor will just ask if they're breastfeeding and if it's not going well, they'll just automatically um, suggest formula. Mm -hmm. And most of the time these moms have a supply, um, they're able to pump and are pumping more than enough to just mm -hmm. only give their baby breast milk, but through a bottle. Mm -hmm. um, so would it be appropriate to suggest to them that they don't necessarily need to give their baby any formula if they're able mm -hmm. to, you know, pump two ounces and give their mm -hmm. baby two ounces every two hours instead of having to give formula. Absolutely. And I feel like they um, suggested or assessed in the visit. Yes, absolutely. I would encourage them to bring that up in the visit. I am making X amount of breast milk. Can I give this instead? And milk is a medicine. Doesn't matter what type of milk it is. Two ounces is usually more than enough to feed a baby's needs, especially every two hours. That would be excellent supply. Um, the caveat to that is I can, maybe there's a case rare. it's rare that a baby needs more than two ounces in a feeding when they're when they're three or four days old. If a baby is severely dehydrated and there's a, thought that the breast milk supply isn't enough, then maybe formula is being recommended in that situation. But yes, if you have that supply, use that first. There's nothing magical about formula that clears bilirubin more than breast milk does. Um, I have a question um, because um, some of them, I mean, we see them within two weeks, right? And usually um, hopefully within the first week. I have seen babies that um, the doctor has said, the pediatrician has told them, um, you need to formula feed. And even though they have a great milk supply, you know, babies having enough wet, wet diapers um, and, you know, babies pooping and peeing adequately, the, the pediatrician usually says, you need to formula feed. You need to do it every other feeding. Um, and then the mom comes to me and says, you know, I try to give the baby formula, but he doesn't want it. He just doesn't want it. He doesn't want it. Um, and then when he does take it, he gets constipated. So he's mm -hmm. having less diapers now when I give him formula. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously this is not milk 
uh, breast milk jaundice because it's so early on, right? Mm -hmm. So how can we counsel them? I mean, I usually say, well, you have enough milk, you know, if you feel like this is working best for you, Mm -hmm. um, keep doing that, but let the doctor know, this is what I have decided to do. Can you please let me know why I need to formula feed? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times when they come back to me, they said, well, the pediatrician is telling me that my milk is causing them to have jaundice. So I need to formula feed. So I, it's, it's very frustrating for me because I don't want to go against the pediatrician, but Mm -hmm. at the same time, it's like, I don't think it's your milk. How can we, how can we help a mom like that? That's a really frustrating situation to be in. Yeah. Especially because in that situation, you've already counseled the parent to go clarify with the pediatrician what the situation was. I don't have a perfect answer for you um, because I can't speak to how every pediatrician is going to approach this. Um, But I would encourage them to keep clarifying because if it really truly started at six days, it's not probably not breast milk jaundice and breast milk jaundice does not require milk to be stopped. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I feel, I get that a lot and it's very Mm -hmm. frustrating Mm -hmm. because, you know, then, you know, breast, their breast milk supply is um, at risk and just a lot of stuff happens, right? Exactly. And then I feel like the combination of pumping and formula is kind of the worst because then you have all the, all the work that goes into that and the cleaning and what I frequently see is then breast milk just stops because formula becomes easier. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Ma- ma'am, I wish I had a better answer for you. I really don't. I. That's how frustrated I get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel your pain. I, I think that I wonder, I imagine if um, maybe, maybe some of this advice to parents comes from a place of wanting to cover their bases and to make sure the baby is being fed. Um, but, and it, it's maybe generational that older guidance was to say to, to stop the breastfeeding for a while and let the use to use formula. Um, I would encourage just ongoing dialogue with the physician. Um, but you are correct that if there is enough supply and you're confident that it's breast milk jaundice and not something else, and it's okay to breastfeed. Okay. But I, I don't know in terms of how you would counsel, I'm not sure. Um, uh, liability wise, how much you were able to go against what the physician has said. Yeah. I will also say, and this is probably that a lot of, uh, I know that most of my patients are telling me 10% of what they're actually doing and are taking my, what I say with a grain of salt and then going out in the world and collating information from everybody else and doing what they're going to do. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're over time. So if you have to go, um, we understand for everybody else and Jody's got her hand up. So I'll let Jody kind of ask the last question. And then obviously if you all have a visit or something you need to go attend to, feel free. Um, go ahead, Jody. Um, I don't have a question you were asking because I'm an IBCLC mm-hmm. up in AV. Mm-hmm. And it seems since um, the pandemic happened that mm-hmm. we are seeing a lot, a lot more pediatricians telling moms. And I think it has to do that they're not being seen as much at the doctors because <laughs> of the pandemic, that that seems like they're really pushing formula, really pushing moms not to breastfeed and to use formula. And it's kind of scary now, especially with the formula mm-hmm. and with everything going on with formula and that we can't find formula. Yeah. So this is really helpful. Thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm really pushing pumping is what I've started doing now. Same. Thank you. Jody. you work in the AV. Where do you work? And Animal Value Partners for Health, but um, I'll have to talk to you a side note because yeah. I am also the Healthy Start person up in AV. Oh, great. We so. need, this is a huge issue in AV. I feel like you guys are the only place I can send people for lactation support. And we also have an amazing breastfeeding coalition that I am the chair of up in okay. AV. Great. So keep in touch with me. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, I, um, I know we're over time, so I just really appreciate all of the questions. This was great to have enough time to go through them all. Um, and, and the resources here, as I mentioned before, we'll have the slide sent out with the, um, 
with the recording. So I'll make sure everybody gets those. We'll send the evaluations in the chat too. But if you um, if you can't complete it right now, I'll send it out via email. But um, yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Randive, for being here today. This is like so informative. I think everybody really appreciated the the chance to discuss with you. So let's all give um, Dr. Alicia a big round of applause. And we hope to have you back another time for more discussion. If you'd like another topic or kind of further in depth, put that in the evaluation and we can we can figure out a way to bring Dr. Rendive back for more. This is really my pleasure. It's, it's This is fun to do and fun to put together and really helpful to me to hear your guys' perspective, especially as I think we may have some overlap in our population and helpful to work together. All right. Thank you all. Have a good day. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Thanks.